Hey, Gary, welcome to the His and Her Money Show. Hello, Gary. Hello, thank you for having me. We are thrilled to have you. We have been admiring your teachers and teachings and trying to learn from them for a very long time now. So we are super excited to have you as a guest on our show. But for those who are unfamiliar with the awesome work that you do, can you just take a moment and introduce yourself to everybody and let them know what you're all about? Sure. I'm primarily a writer and speaker. I'm based in Houston, Texas right now. I'm on the teaching team at Second Baptist Church, and the focus of my ministry has been closer to Christ, closer to others. I want to help people draw closer to the Lord, thinking that that will help us also with our own relationships, primarily in family, but our relationships in general as well. Love that, love that. So what got you interested in serving in marriage ministry? Well, I'd written a number of books, three books actually, on spiritual formation, how we become more like Christ. And I'd never seen somebody approach spiritual formation from the perspective of how God uses marriage to help us grow. In fact, it was almost the opposite. It was almost, if you really want to become more like Christ, become like a monk or nun, you know, go on the the individual retreats and the solitude and the silence and a, a lot of practices, frankly, that just don't fit a marriage very well. If I were to tell my wife, I need to get closer to the Lord. So this Friday and Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to go off by myself to a private retreat while you're here with the kids. I'm not sure that she would receive that as particularly a holy request. And and it was almost like marriage was looked at as inhibiting our ability to grow in Christ. And yet I found that God was using my marriage and even parenting to challenge me in ways I'd never really been challenged as a single. So rather than seeing my marriage as an impediment, I thought, well, what if it's actually one of God's purposes to help us grow, to become more like Christ? And so I just wrote a book in that regard. And really, I think of sacred marriage as more of a a spiritual formation book. My other two books on marriage, A Lifelong Love and Cherish, could be considered more traditional marriage books. But because it was different, I wasn't writing as a therapist or a counselor or something like that. I think it just took off because of that different twist that God can use our marriage to help us grow spiritually. And that's the book that affected us the most. We read the book, we did the devotional, and it's such a powerful classic book that I highly recommend for yeah. all couples to read. But what exactly the term sacred marriage What exactly is a sacred marriage and why should we be striving to create one? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I was getting my teeth cleaned last week and a dental hygienist said, so you write these books on marriage. What's the key? And I I give you that in one word. I said, it's God. I, I, I think the more we let God into our lives and into our marriage, the bigger impact it makes. And she admitted that she and her husband really, church isn't a part of their life at this point. She thought she needs to get back. But more than I'd say church, I, I think it's God. I, I could tell you honestly, 90% of the changes I've made in my marriage haven't been because my wife has come to me and said, Gary, I'm so frustrated. You got to change this or that. It's come from praying and God convicting me saying, Gary, you're not, Lisa isn't just your wife. She's my daughter. I expect you to treat her accordingly. And the ability to to be convicted by the Spirit, the ability to have God challenge me on on how I'm treating my wife, God has been the biggest impact in my own marriage. And and that's why I often say to singles why I think they're really cutting themselves short when they marry somebody who's not just a believer, but somebody who listens to the Lord, somebody we might call filled with the Spirit in the sense that God is— an active part in their life. I said, God will be your biggest advocate in marriage. He wants you to be loved. He wants you to be supported. He wants you to have a helper in your ministry, whatever that is. And and what do you think is going to help with your spouse more, your nagging or God's conviction? And so when we recognize that bringing God into marriage will challenge us in the way we treat our spouse, but also will bless us in the way our spouse treats us, I, I, I just think we only view God as a theory and an ideal, not as a reality. Sacred marriage is all about making God a reality, that he is challenging us, he is shaping us, that he sets the priorities, he speaks the words into our hearts, and he gives us the strength to live it out. I love that. I love that. You know, 
most times, even if we're in disagreements and things like that, I take it to the Lord in prayer. And I, the Holy Spirit is so very, very important, even in marriage, because the Holy Spirit is a teacher, you know, and sometimes my words may not be able to convince you or your words may not be able to convince me, but the Lord knows how to touch our heart and how to change us. And so I love that. I love how you, you know, how you want us to reflect on ourselves and not our mate, not our spouse. I love that. So in the beginning of your marriage, you and your wife, you know, you all had, you all came from different backgrounds per se, or, you know, you were raised different ways. How do you both come to a middle ground, especially in a marriage when he likes to do something a certain way, but I prefer to do it a different way. Like I got a perfect example. This is what I still haven't figured out in almost 12 years of marriage. What? I still I yet to figure out to say, why anybody would put hot sauce yes. in the refrigerator. Yes. It's called hot sauce. No. Why do you put it in the refrigerator? Because it's a condiment. Like all condiments should be refrigerated. Um, I love hot sauce. Mine goes in the refrigerator, oh, but yes. I'm just saying, oh, maybe come I'm... on. But hey, here's a for for Lisa and I. It wasn't hot sauce, but it was food. I grew up the consummate junk food junkie. Captain Crunch, Big Macs, pizza, and ice cream were my four food groups in high school and college. Lisa grew up in a family that ate much healthier. Her mom would make their own bread, and they would eat. Things that grow, stuff like that. So that that was sort of her view. And she said to me, have you ever noticed that my food has to be washed? Your food has to be opened. And that's the difference. She eats what God creates. I tended to eat what came out of machines. Now, the reason that I went to her side wasn't just to please her. It was really, again, being convicted by God to take care of my body, to be a little more reasonable about that. And, and so I, I think... The best way to deal with that is letting Jesus be your Lord. You're not trying to please a spouse so much as you're saying, do they understand a, a part of serving God and being a disciple of Christ that I don't? And in Lisa's case with food, she does. Now, sometimes we, we have to push back. In fact, this is just about a month ago. I thought I was having a healthy day. Uh, I'd had a breakfast that Lisa had cooked, so everything was locally sourced, organic, no antibiotics, all of that. My, I'd gone for a 10-mile run. Uh, lunch was heated up from an organic restaurant that we went to the night before. But we were traveling that evening in, through an airport, and so I stopped at Starbucks. I got a turkey, cheddar, and kale sandwich. And to wash the sandwich down, I got a bag of Doritos. And Lisa's face just fell when she saw the Doritos. And I said, honey, and look, people listen to this. You shouldn't ever compare your spouse like I did. This isn't a good example, but I did. I said, honey, look, it, you know my day. I, I ran 10 miles. You cooked the breakfast, had a healthy lunch. I'm eating a turkey cheddar kale sandwich and a one bag of Doritos. I think 90% of wives would say, my husband has been very healthy today. And Lisa said, I know. Aren't you glad you married the 10% who really cares about your health? <laughs> I love at, Lisa. <laughs> at that point, I wanted to say, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I, I think you could give me a break. I, you know, I, I don't think I should eat Doritos with every meal. I think once a week may not be so bad given the rest of the day. So it's, you know, I, it, it's just kind of the give and take. I think what causes the most problem isn't the issue. It's our pride. Uh, we don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to be challenged. But I, I think if you have two people who believe in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you're just calling each other to Christ's righteousness, that, that, that's different. If I've got a temper that's out of control, it's not really about me and Lisa. It's about me and God, because there are several passages in Colossians, Ephesians, and 1 Peter, get rid of all anger, rage, malice, slander. Filthy talk. Well, okay, now it's not just Lisa's asking me to do that. She's reminding me that God's asking me to do that. But on the other hand, if a wife is being overly negative, you can go to the verses, well, encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. So it's, it's just saying that together as a couple, we stand under Scripture, and Jesus is our Lord. So it's legitimate to call each other to the truth of scripture, to call each other to submit to the Lordship of Christ. So it's not about husband and wife as much as it is about honoring God. That's, that's the safest way to do it. But as I mentioned, 
the thing with food, I, I don't think Lisa will ever be completely pleased with how I eat, but I eat a whole lot better than I would have if I had never married her. Yeah. And, it, you know, staying on that whole line of, you know, focusing on God, I think it was a very fascinating point that really stood out in reading your book. And you alluded to it earlier. You got to the place to where you realized that your wife was God's daughter. Yes. And so that God was your father-in-law. And yeah. that changed your perspective on how you interacted with your wife. Can you kind of break that concept down yeah. for us? There have been a couple times in life, I, I'd say maybe three, where I was just floored by something that God challenged me with. And that was the first one. I, I wasn't being a very good husband. And it's just in prayer. God is applying First John 3, 1. Behold, it we're how great a love the Father's given us that we should be called the children of God. And I'd claim that as a single man, but God was saying to me, Gary, Lisa isn't just your wife. She's my daughter. And I expect you to treat her accordingly. And when I, I have three kids, two of them daughters, and when I had my own daughters, I, I got it. I mean, I, I was so overwhelmed by the love a father has for his daughters. When my first daughter was born, she was our first child. I was actually a pacifist. I'd studied with an Anabaptist professor. I'd read a lot of books and really thought about it. That completely changed the day my daughter was born. And, and I didn't read any new books. I didn't hear any new sermons. I didn't look at any new scriptures. All that happened is a wife took that baby girl, put her on my wife's chest. I took one look at that little girl and said to myself, if anybody touches her, I'll be doing prison ministry from the inside. <laughs> for the rest of my life. I mean, it, it was just an entirely new dimension for me, this God-given sense of, of protection. And so I began to realize from that day on that God looks at my wife just as I look at my daughters with a holier and pure affection. And, and I don't care what anybody else does for me. They could give me money. They could memorize what I write. They could now, this gets gross, but I'm making it now. They could even sing songs about me. If they're making one of my daughters miserable by abuse or neglect, none of it matters to me. And it helped me understand 1 Peter 3 when he said, Husbands, love your, treat your wives with respect so that nothing will hinder your prayers. When you see God as your heavenly father-in-law, you realize that because he views your wife as his daughter, if you're abusing his daughter, if you're neglecting his daughter, if you're not cherishing and making his daughter feel safe and loved and valued, that's all he wants to talk to us about. He says, look, before we get to the stuff you care about, let me tell you what I care about. What I care about most is my daughter. And I think every man and frankly, every woman listening will get this. If you want to get on a parent's good side, be good to their kids. If you want to get on a parent's bad side, be mean to their kids, shame their kids, humiliate their kids. When we understand that God is not just our heavenly father, but when we become married, also our heavenly father in law, for me, that has radically transformed the way I look at my marriage, the way I treat my wife. Policy Genius guarantees the best life insurance price for you and those you love. It's so simple to protect your family today in five easy steps. One, calculate quotes. Two, compare companies. Three, apply online. Four, receive expert advice. And five, rest easy. It really is that simple. Calculate, compare, Apply with Policy Genius. For more info, head on over to hisandhermoney.com forward slash Policy Genius. So how do you advise couples who struggle in the area of communication uh, to get better in that area? Well, in that area, and I'm not the best at the how to, to be honest. I usually focus on the heart to the why. For me, this isn't really communication, but it, it's a form of it. I hated conflict. I thought if I made a wise marital choice, there wouldn't be conflict. And what I had to understand is that conflict can really help somebody understand each other. And so with communication, it's all about the heart. It's what can I learn about you? Okay, now I see why you're so passionate about this. Now I see that you really care about this. This isn't something tangential to you. This is something that is at the heart and soul of who you are. That's why you're responding so vigorously. 
and, and then in in the book Cherish, where I was really challenged, and I and I talk more about this. I realized that for my wife to feel cherished, not just love, but cherish, I had to maintain my curiosity. I, I married an extrovert who really likes to talk. And uh, it, my friends knew this one time when I, my, my best friend called the house and my oldest daughter was still at home and she answered the phone. He says, hey, Allie, is Gary there? She goes, no, but my mom's here. And before he, she could say anything, he said, I don't have that kind of time. And he hung up. So, I mean, I, I, I get that. But you know what? For my wife to feel cherished, I need to say, tell me more. Now, why did you say that? Why did that happen? That for her, communication is a big part of being loved. And, and in an age of iPads and iPhones and screens, and I'm not really into video games, but I know a lot of guys are. Guys, I would say we listen with our eyes as much as our ears. And if we're not looking at our wives – they don't think we're hearing them. And so communication really begins with sight before it begins with sound. It's powerful. Yeah. Another uh, powerful concept that you teach is that we have to, and, and it's something that you say we have to be careful of. And what we need to do in marriage is we need to use our marriage as a mirror and not use our marriage as a weapon. What were you trying to teach us there? James 3, 2 says we all stumble in many ways. The challenge is we don't realize how often we stumble. James had the benefit of growing up with Jesus. So he could compare himself to a perfect man and said, you know what? Compared to a perfect man, yeah, you and me, the best of us on our best day, we stumble in many ways. But we don't compare ourselves to Jesus. We find the worst husband in the church, wives find the worst wife in the church, and we compare ourselves to that. And so we tell our spouse, well, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not like Fred. Or I'm not like Sarah, or, you know, all, all of that. And, and so when I recognize that God has given my wife to me as a mirror, I might not see myself as an irritable kind of person, but when I'm getting irritated, instead of blaming her for irritating me, I might say, Gary, why are you annoyed by this? Um, it, it's so much easier to blame our spouse. Instead of saying, I have a problem with anger, we blame our spouse for making us angry. Instead of me saying, I have a problem with lust, we blame our spouse for not being more accommodating or affectionate. Instead of blaming ourselves for being negative or critical, we just say, well, my husband's a doofus. My, my wife isn't very godly. And so we, we take our faults and and we excuse them by saying our spouse is eliciting that. So if we look at marriage and say, you know what? It's not about whether I'm holier than my spouse, holier than that husband or holier than that wife. It's really compared to Jesus. I'm, I have a lot of growing to do. So I'm going to let marriage reveal where I'm weakest and ask the question, why am I so angry here? Uh, why am I so irritated? Why am I being so self? Why do I need to get my own way? I, I said in my most recent blog post, and this is where I really sinned as a young husband. If I'm left to myself without God's spirit to correct me and convict me, I can become this monstrous ego that wants to turn my wife into a love Gary as he likes to be loved machine. And I want to always correct her. I want to challenge her. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want her to put me out. I want her to do what I want her to do. I don't want her to do what annoys me. And I realize that is narcissism. That's evil. But I think a lot of us kind of have that perspective. How can I help my spouse be better at loving me instead of how do I help my spouse become all that God created them to be? I believe you're referring to the article – the evil in marriage we rarely mention. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. And we'll actually, be sure yes. to link that in the show notes of this episode. So, I mean, help us out there because you kind of mentioned what that evil is, but then how do we correct it if yeah. we find that to be the case for ourselves? Well, the evil is self-obsession and we all have it to some degree. We grow in and out of it because we've stopped living by Matthew six thirty three: Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that the first thing I should seek, and in the Greek it's continuous tense, continually keep on seeking the kingdom of God. 
my fulfillment, my sense of purpose should come from building God's kingdom. I wake up instead of saying, what do I want today? How do I want others to treat me? It's Lord, you've given me certain resources. You've given me time, certain talents. I have certain relationships. How do you want to use me in every situation today? How can I give myself over to building your work? And if I, for me, if I'm not consciously doing that, I'm unconsciously falling into self-obsession. How come they're not noticing me? How come she isn't complimenting me? How come he's not appreciating me? How come they're not doing this? They're, they're letting me down. They're, they're not stepping up. And I, I, I start to try to create this world where my needs are met instead of am I serving God as he's called me to. And so part of the article on self-obsession means not just me seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but recognizing that's my spouse's call as well. She's called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So I should be focusing on how I can encourage her and support her and release her to do that as well. It's not just about me being the faithful Christian. It's about helping my wife to be the faithful Christian as well. So it's a whole different view of marriage. It's basically putting to death our narcissism, ordering our thoughts and our minds around God, and an attitude of serving our spouse instead of demanding from our spouse. What are some disciplines uh, that you and your wife have incorporated in your marriage over the years to help you guys maintain a sacred marriage? I, I think the first one, well, and really the only one I would almost mention, to be honest, is 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. Lisa and I are both pretty faithful about spending time with the Lord in the morning. Uh, I see Lisa, she likes to go into our library. There's a fireplace, of course, in Houston. You only like the fireplace about six weeks out of the year. But um, she likes the ambiance. I'm up in my study. And, and I've just found the more I receive from God in the morning, the more I'm able to give to others. If I if I skip out on that time, or if I reduce that time. I'm not affirmed by God. I don't feel loved by God. I don't feel chosen by God. I don't feel empowered by God. That's when I start to go throughout the day trying to get those spiritual needs met through other people, and my wife will pay the heaviest price, as would my kids when they lived with me. So I think the most important discipline, I I know it sounds like a cliche, it's just I think it happens to be true. When the day starts with worship, when the day starts with us, as Colossians tells us, knowing that we are chosen and dearly loved, then I can face any situation. I can face rejection from a kid. I can face a spouse having a bad day. God is reminded, Gary, I chose you. You don't have to prove yourself. I love you. Others might notice you. I got that. Life is just different when I take care of those spiritual needs first. Mm. You're right. Uh, I keep saying this, you know, a powerful quote because sacred marriage is full of powerful quotes, but uh, another one that really jumped out was you said that a good marriage isn't something that you find. It's something that you work for. Help us out. How do we put in that work to get that sacred, that good marriage? Yeah, I have an image I give to premarital couples. It, it sort of forms a theme of my book, A Lifelong Love, where I warn them that too many couples view a marriage like you're planting a tree. You put a sapling in the ground, you stake it, you fertilize it, you water it, they're deer around, you you put a fence around it to protect it. But you know, after a while, once that tree gets going, you don't need to worry about the stakes. It's strong enough on its own. It can handle the deer. It gets its own nutrients. It gets its own water. And that's how we treat our romantic relationships. Early on, we stake it. We protect it. We What are we doing for fun this weekend? We, we touch. We feed it. We're talking. We're resolving conflict. A lot of couples go through premarital counseling. They go to pre uh, marriage conferences. They read books. They're talking about the relationship. They do everything you have to do to make a relationship grow. But then we get married. We have kids, have a job, have mortgage. And suddenly we think we can stop doing all of that. And because we gave the marriage a good start, like a tree, it's going to continue to grow. But I think all of us have seen when couples have been married, they they may not even make it to the 10th anniversary if they just quit feeding their marriage and protecting their marriage and watering their marriage. 
So I don't think the right image is that a marriage is like planting a tree. I think the better image is that marriage is like building a brick house that you put together brick by brick. And if you stop building it, even if you're 80% of the way done, it doesn't finish itself. In fact, the elements come in, the weather will assault it, and eventually the walls are going to start to crumble. It gets old and it collapses. And so marriage isn't just saying I do. It's saying I will. I'm going to keep building this relationship. I'm going to make you a priority. We're going to talk. I'm, I'm going to listen. I'm not going to let you be the only person invested in this relationship. We're going to build this thing together. The encouragement for this, the reason I like this image is that so often if a marriage isn't working, people think, well, must have married the wrong person. You can't fix that. We just have to get a divorce. But if a marriage is something you build, you can say, you know what? We haven't been building it, but we can start again. We can rebuild it. We can fix this thing. And so I just think it gives a truer model and a truer image of what it takes to have a lasting marriage and how to keep the marriage going strong until the end. You know, I think one of those bricks um, that is required to build a strong marriage, you you kind of uncovered it. And I I haven't really heard anybody really talk about it. And it's, it's like a real obvious issue, especially when you first get married. And you talked about how it was tough for you in the beginning to learn interdependence. And even the little things like you have to learn how to like allow yourself to to pray with someone else. You were so used to just having your quiet time to yourself. And now it's like, wait, I have to pray with you. And, you know, like that's something that's right there. That's obvious that a lot of people don't talk about how when you are married, now you have to learn how to join your life with someone else. Any advice there? Well, I'll be honest. I've been married 33 years and I still struggle with that. (laughs) I mean, I I confess it in sacred marriage, but we all have our weaknesses. And I think that's one of mine. I'm an introvert and I've always been focused on my life. Am I having the time with the Lord? Am I being a good husband? Am I getting done what I need to do? And it's just hard for me to think, you know, it's not just me now. It's we. I've got to bring my wife along. Are we praying together? Are we serving God together? Am I inviting her to be a bigger part of this. Um, I have to fight against my introversion at times. I mean, I chose to get married, so I need to open up the door. Lisa is very gentle and gracious about that. She gets that about me. She doesn't press too much. But marriage is a relationship of interdependence that we go farther if we bring each other along. You know, I I remember the Olympics, this last summer Olympics, uh, one of the women's volleyball members, this was beach volleyball where they just have two. um, And I'm sorry, I forget the names. It was, um, but but, but the the lead woman had never lost before. She'd had gold medals before. She was with a new partner, but she was having a bad day. And the other team that eventually defeated him just kept, hitting the ball her way. They'd spike it her way. They were picking on her. And to her credit afterwards, she said, I've got to do better. They came back and they won the bronze medal. But she recognized this is a two-person sport. And if one person isn't performing, the the weakness is going to be exploded and the team's going to go down. And it's that way in marriage. If we're just thinking about our relationship with God, us doing the right thing, us being able to get what we need to do to serve God and all that. Well, that's a weakness. That's a weakness that Satan can exploit. We've got to look at it. We're a two-person team. We're only going to be as strong as each other's strong. I'm worried about me getting enough sleep, but is my wife getting enough sleep? I'm worried about my health, but am I equally worried about my wife's health? I'm worried about my ministry. Well, am I equally worried about my wife's ministry? It really does come down to interdependence, And but I'll be honest— I'm still trying to grow in that area. I don't think I've mastered it. So tell us more about your latest release, Loving Him Well, Practical Advice on Influencing Your Husband. It's a book for wives. The original book was called Sacred Influence. It came out in 2004, 14 years ago. I wrote it when I lived up in Bellingham, Washington. We were a little bit shielded from the world, to be honest. The kind of families that are up there, it's just below the Canadian borders, 90 miles north of Seattle. And 
I, w- one woman challenged me. She said, Gary, I love this book. I want to go through it in a group with other wives that are my friends. She goes, I'm going to be honest. Every woman I know that's married and has kids has a full-time job. And you almost act like we don't exist. And I, I just – I moved to Houston eight years ago, nation's fourth largest city. I've gotten a bigger picture of some of the issues that more women face outside the small confines of the town where I grew up. And so uh, I think I just gained more experience and more understanding. And so it's about 50% rewritten. Uh, One of the big differences, when I wrote it in 2004, there were a few paragraphs on pornography. Well, now pornography not only has a chapter on its own, it's the biggest chapter in the book. Because the advent of high-speed internet Pornography has become a new threat to marriages in a way that it wasn't 15 years ago. So it just helps women understand. It says this is how God helps you grow from a guy's perspective. This is kind of the way we guys think we're different. But in general, this is how we think. This is how God helps you create a platform of influence. Women need to understand that men are influenced by people we respect. If we're golfing with a guy who can barely break 100 and he tells us to hold our club a little tighter, looser, we don't care what he says because we don't respect him. If Tiger Woods walked up and said, hold, well, now we're listening because he knows what he's talking about. And so how do you become that person that your husband respects and how do you influence your husband out of that platform of respect? And then it goes through a lot of the issues just that women face, a husband that's too involved in hobbies. Husband that gets in trouble on the internet. Um, an angry husband that doesn't have his anger under control. One woman talks about her journey of being married to a non-Christian for 22 years before he became a believer. How God sustained her and how ultimately she believed God led him to the Lord. So it's filled with encouragement for wives, but also practical steps. This is how you can be an influence in the life of the man you marry. Awesome. We'll be sure to have a link to that book as well in the show notes. So, Gary, tell everybody how to keep in touch with you. Your website, you got the Focus on the Family show. Let them know. Well, thank you. Uh, Probably the best way is my website. It's GaryThomas.com. They can remember my name, Gary Thomas. They got it, GaryThomas.com. There's links there to Twitter or Facebook or the blog that you mentioned is there. Uh, They can look at all the books. There's a button there at the books that they could See me talk about some of the books, read sample chapters, go through some reviews and figure out the cheapest way to buy it if they want. Uh, So that's all there. GaryThomas.com. Awesome. Gary, this has been incredible. It's been amazing and super, super educational. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to share this great information with us today. Thank you. Well, Look, I'm honored, especially I love talking to husband and wife teams together. So God bless you what you're doing. You're doing a great work. I really appreciate it. Thank you.